Hello, folks. This is Dr. Virinder Swadi with your favorite show, Your Body's a Natural Pharmacy. And uh, I've been, uh, whenever I go out in the community, I hear a lot of good things about our show. People come and really congratulate me, and they, they say they are learning a lot of things. And that's what was my purpose of starting this program, to educate people, because we are our body's pharmacy. We don't need a lot of drugs to heal us. Actually, if you look at overall, if we had more drugs, we put more drugs in our system, we die prematurely. And there is a very sad statistics about it. Uh, the number one cause of death is heart disease. Number two is cancer. And the number third cause, leading cause of death, is pharmaceutical drugs and hospital errors. So that tells you how much confidence you should put in the drug treatment only. Uh, I'm not against using drugs. Yes, they have a value. They have a purpose. But the way we get uh, enforced that drugs on us, which is remarkably re bad for us, and this is not right. And uh, our body can do a lot of wonderful things to heal. And today, I my topic is colon cancer, and we have a wonderful guest. She's going to come on, and uh, uh, her name is Roseanne Kanahai, and uh, she had a uh, metastatic colon cancer that is, means your stage four. If it has spread to different organs in the body, and she is in remission for the last six years. And we are going to talk to this wonderful lady who has fought this disease. And, and along the way, she had a lot of different things happen in her life, very, very serious. And I really congratulate her to face those troubles in her life and coming along and living her life the, to the fullest. And so we are going to talk to her pretty soon. She is going to call on the show, and then we'll be uh, asking her lots of questions uh, what happened with her and all those stuff. You know. uh, so first of all, the colon cancer is the second leading cause of death uh, among the uh, cancers. And uh, so, you know, basically very important for us to have uh, uh, the screening done for it. The the American uh, uh, Cancer Society recommends that by the age 50, we should have a colon screening done. And I believe that's very important because I've seen people who which I have asked them to do the colon screening, but they have not done it and they end up having a problem with the uh, the uh, the colon cancer and it was too late by the time they got diagnosed so one of the interesting thing is know your symptoms and if you have a your bowels habit have changed you need to watch if you got constipated all of a sudden your bowel moves movements are were fine and then you starting to get constipation all of a sudden and then your Consistency in the stools changes, uh, either loose or watery. Uh, you see a blood in the stool. And so that is very, very, uh, you know, very important about, uh, you know, to note this symptom, abdominal bloating and uh, feeling you can't completely empty your bowls. So all those things are on colon cancer. There is actually a, a caller who's calling regarding the metabolism and natural food. Uh, so I can answer that question quickly, but I'd like to get this uh, our guest on. So what is your question, caller? Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, hi. Good afternoon, Dr. Sodi. This is Richa from Piala. Hi, Richa. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. My question for you today is, what is the role of metabolism and detoxification in naturally healing our bodies? As you know, according to Ayurveda, metabolism is good for our health and well-being, eating healthy foods, exercising, pranayam, all kind of, that's all good for us. And the detoxification is also considered a key strategy in naturally healing our bodies. So my twofold question is, how do metabolism and detoxification help our bodies naturally heal? Thank you. So, yeah. So, okay, I'm going to have to be short here, Richa, because we have a guest on, but I will answer your question. So this is a natural phenomenon in our body. When we follow the laws of Mother Nature, like we go to bed 10 o'clock, we wake up by 6 o'clock, your metabolism is naturally fine. When you are, uh, you know, uh, when you're eating according to the Mother Nature, you eat according to what is available, like fruits and vegetables. And basically, you need to have a lot more emphasis on vegetarian kind of food, uh, eating less sugar. Sugars are awfully bad for you. Even eating heavy meats are bad. Small amount of meats may be okay. Uh, stress reduction is very important. 
Exercise is very important. So if there is a balance. Whole body has this homeostasis, and it automatically works with it. But we have to put it in. And uh, what we put it in through our exercise, through our food, through our sleeping, proper amount of sleep, and stress reduction. And if we do it, the metabolism automatically listens to us. So I'm going to uh, carry on the uh, discussion on the colon cancer. So if you have any one of those symptoms, like your frequency of the bowel movements have changed, you got constipated, the consistency of the stool change, and there is a blood in the stool, you got erectile bleeding, you're getting abdominal pain, and you feel... Uh, that you can't completely empty yourself. There may be symptoms, this may be a symptom of colon cancer. Uh, and you know, some of these symptoms all of us have. So that does not mean you have a cancer, colon cancer there. M you know, one time or the other we feel constipated, we get bloated, uh, we ate too much of a sugary thing, or we ate too many beans, uh, or we ate too, many, too much broccoli, we all get bloated with those kind of stuff, which is natural. So you don't have colon cancer with that. But if you constantly have that, you need to watch for that. So that's the one thing what you need to look at. And uh, looking at the statistics, around 50,000 people are going to die with colon cancer this year, which is sad, and more than 100,000 patients will get diagnosed with colon cancer. So that is about the statistics of it. And, you know, it is really important that we take care of ourselves. Doctor is there to help you. Doctor is not you. You have your own body. We need to understand, I think that's the model which we have created wrong in this country, that we think that our doctor is responsible for our health. He cannot be. We are responsible for our own health. And how we make our health more healthier is following the simple laws of Mother Nature. Uh, very important is stress reduction, exercise, uh, eat, drinking enough amount of water, cutting down the sugars, eating lots of fruits and vegetables. You will go on hearing me saying that again and again and again because these are the fundamentals of staying health in health. And uh, when you don't follow those fundamentals, you are going to have problems. So coming back to the colon cancer again, the there are uh, the American Cancer Society uh, recommends that everybody should have uh, a colonoscopy by the age of 50. So in this one, uh, what it is done, you know, you throw a camera, a, a flexible camera into the colon, into the large intestine, and uh, uh, this is uh, the gift to us by Dr. Shinya, who is a professor emeritus, uh, who for the first time uh, put the flexible camera inside the colon and uh, start looking at the different uh, uh, stages of the colon cancer and the other things in the colon. And uh, since then, it has become a standard. And uh, so the uh, standard recommendation is that you do it every 10 years if you don't have any problem. But if you have a problem, then you need to do more frequently, sometimes fi every five years, sometimes every year, depending upon what the situation is. And uh, so uh, this is also can be done by a, uh, the virtual colonography or CT scan. If you don't want to do the... Uh, the colonoscopy, some people fear, and in my clinic I see a lot of people who say, oh my God, I can't have a colonoscopy. They have heard this horrible story. Somebody got ruptured uh, uh, no, colon with it, or they got infections and all those kind of stuff. Uh, because, you know, there's, th this is a possibility, but a remote possibility. It's not that everybody is going to have that. Uh, I had my own colonoscopy done too, so because this is, I feel is important. And uh, But there are other thing which you need to be done, there is a test which is called GOAC test. Basically, what we're checking, if you're passing any microscopic blood, which should be done every year uh, above age 50. And there is also a fecal immunochemical testing which can be done every year. And there is also a stool DNA. Now, there is another new test uh, available called Cologuard, which is a, you can find out by, uh, it's a DNA testing, and you can see if you have a, a colon cancer going on. Of course, you know, you these tests, our prelim, the gold standard is uh, colonoscopy because then you can see and if you have any polyp, anything inside your uh, colon which can be resected or removed, uh, and then you know we will send for biopsy and then from there and can be treated properly. And uh, so an interesting thing is that the African Americans has more chances of developing a colorectal cancer. And, but if we look at their ancestors back from in Africa, 
uh, in Uganda, they have very less colon cancer. So I think the funny thing is something has changed. What has changed, I think, is the lifestyle, the food. What they are eating is not the best one. So that can, stuff can really put into a lot of uh, uh, stress on the system, and uh, we can have a disease like a colon cancer. So uh, the, I, I'm going to talk about different, different things, you know, about the staging of colon cancer and uh, what the you know, different survival of the colon cancer is. And uh, uh, so basically, so, you know, the, like uh, if you have a, any cancer is a bad word when somebody is uh, uh, told that he has or she has a colon cancer, then, you know, you're certainly, it's a very shocking uh, to you. And uh, so one thing is, I think a lot more people die with the shock of colon ca or the cancer, not only colon cancer, rather than the cancer itself, because it's such a distressing disease. Uh, so uh, colon cancer has also divided into different stages. Stage zero, when there is a some kind of abnormal cell found in the mucosa of the colon, uh, in the lining of the colon, and which is called carcinoma in situ. In situ means it's situated in that place. And usually that's removed and nothing is done uh, except for that. Uh, you know, you can uh, have a uh, no chemo, no radiation. Stage one is when it actually has invaded into the lining of the uh, your uh, intestines. And uh, then usually also the treatment is surgery uh, and uh, not usually done any uh, chemotherapies for that. Stage two, when the colon cancer has spread beyond that colon barriers and it's also divided into three stages which call A, B, and C. So this is, you know, uh, again, this depends upon how invasive is it, chemotherapy can be added. Of course, the surgery is a standard procedure. And stage three, when it has gone to the lymph nodes, the surrounding, and stage four, when it's spread to different organs, like liver or lungs and those kind of stuff. So, and there's a, you know, slew of uh, chemotherapy which is given. The survival with different cancers are pretty good. Uh, stage one, people, 92% survival almost, so pretty good, you know. Uh, I think this is one of the cancers if you detected earlier, the survival is really good. And uh, stage one where you just had the surgery done and not chemo and any radiation, the survival is pretty good, up to 92%. Stage two, uh, the five-year survival is 87%, and stage one at uh, 2B, the survival rate is 63%. And in uh, uh, stage three, the survival is anywhere between 89 to 53%, and stage four, the survival is 11%. So you can see, as the staging increases, most of the colon cancer is getting worse and worse and worse. So as I said, we have a wonderful guest today, her name is Roseanne Kanahai, and I'm going to talk to her in great, uh, great deals. And uh, she's a wonderful lady. I've known her for almost now six plus years. And uh, uh, she is a, uh, a professor, a retired professor from the university, very literate uh, and uh, written books and, uh, and a wonderful, wonderful lady. Roseanne, uh, you know, welcome to the show, and uh, we are very happy to have you on our show, Your Bodies in Natural Pharmacy. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Roseanne. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sori. And let me start by saying thanks to you for inviting me to participate in this program. Uh, my comment will state the value of doctors offering health information and advice to the community in this format, which you have been doing in this program. And thanks for creating a space where your patients like me can come on and have a voice. Um, so let me get right into my story. Sure. Um, my, my history. So I was diagnosed with colon cancer stage 3 in 2008. Well, that's something that nobody expects. So my reaction, my first reaction was disbelief. Yeah. This was just not happening to me. Exactly. Then there was confusion. Then there was terror. I was horrified. I was terrified. Just the word cancer, you know, makes you terrified and horrified. So all these strong emotions, what did I do? I, I kind of got into a stage of numbness. I was just in a daze and went through the process of a colon resection surgery. Yeah. It, it all happened very quickly. So what that, uh, for my listeners, you know, I want to, because, you know, 
uh, you are very literate. So I want to just turn into a little simple English. So the c- colon section means the colon was cut, removed. So, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Roseanne. Yeah. Yep. So before I knew what was happening, I was being fitted with a porter cap. Yeah. So which chemotherapy would be fed into the arteries close to my heart. Yeah. Not quite understanding what was going on. Um, they were throwing big words at me, like oh, flatten and... But I didn't understand, I, and I didn't just have the, the 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 wherewithal to sit and research it because I was just so much in a daze. And any protest on my part was countered by a stern warning from the oncologist that I would be dead in six months if I did not follow his protocol. So you were given six months to live if you don't follow the I protocol. Was, I was given six months. That was in 2008. Yeah, this is actually, you know, I, I hear it all the time, and... What I believe as a doctor, we don't have that role, and nobody can decide yes. when you're going to die. And this is actually one right. of the worst thing we do in medical community because what we are giving a patient a death sentence, even if you don't want to die, yes. because you know yes. that's exactly what happened to my father. Uh, he had a, a, yes. a metastatic uh, lung cancer, and uh, mm-hmm. when he saw the doctor, and uh, the doctor said you have one month to live. And he followed the doctor's order to the last point, and he lived only one hmm. month after that. So I'm. See, I'm that's what happens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a death sentence. Telling you you have cancer is a death sentence, and then on top of that, they give you a timeline. Yeah. You know, I, I was also bewildered that, for example, um, the infusion nurses were wearing these special gloves so that they would not be contaminated by the potent chemicals. Yeah. But these chemicals were being put directly into me. So, but it was such that I just couldn't ask any questions, you know. Um, so I was prescribed twelve treatments. I completed three. So you were By you were asked to take twelve chemotherapy treatment, but you only well, completed three. Why did you did stop three. the treatments? I did three because I was sure that this was not good for me. Uh-huh. The dehydration, the nausea, the weakness, and then to top it all. At a point, I was getting such severe pains on my right shoulder and arm, yeah. and I was. And when they investigated, it was because my body was rejecting the port, yeah, and building up um, blood clots, yeah. Right, so I still have some of those blood clots, but this is not something that they had warned me about. They had not educated me that this could be a possible risk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that is when I thought about death, actually. I thought that this is what the death machine was. This is what the death process was. And I had to get out of the clutches of this protocol because that is what was leading me to death. Yeah. You know, that was what was taking away my vitality and my hope and just my autonomy. So I stopped. Yeah. But I did not, will, I did not know where to go and what to do. I started reading about alternative treatments. Some just seemed impossibly difficult, some seemed hokey, some were too costly. You know, I was looking for a protocol that was scientific and that was yet kind, not invasive and destructive. Sure. Um, so in the meanwhile, the cancer was metastasizing. Yeah. And by 2010, there was a carcinoma in my liver. So you had a, your, the cancer has spread to liver then? It spread to my liver. Yeah. And they, I they remember removed, that, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, they removed 75% of my liver. Yeah. That was there. And when I went to the oncologist afterwards, he said to me, he says, Rosanne, I know you won't follow my regime, so I won't even give it to you. I will just tell you, you don't even have months to live. You have weeks. Wow. So you were so told I they have only it. weeks to live, not even yes. months. Said, wow. And you, six you years later, you're still standing. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm still here. 2016, I'm still here. Yes. He said, I, I know you won't do what I tell you to do because you're just stubborn. So, you, you know, you're going to just get weak. Wow. So that was the fall of 2010. So that was six years ago. Yeah. He did not even, he told me I had a 90% chance of recurrence because it was stage four cancer and he left it to that. I, I guess he gave up on me. Yeah. I did not give up on, on myself. Yes. And I was still looking around. And then fortunately, my daughter-in-law, Lee, gave me the number of your clinic because she has a restaurant and somebody had come into the restaurant who had been a patient of yours. Yeah. But that's how I found the clinic. And then I called you out of the country. 
So um, Ranjit, your um, person gave me an appointment with Dr. Shailinder. Yes. So that was my first contact with the clinic. Yeah. Right? Dr. Shailinder is knowledgeable, experienced, he's kind, he's a spiritually strong person. And soon I was just sobbing on his shoulders. Yeah. Because of how he had humanized the encounter. Yes. Just the way he talked to me, the way he took my vitals. He just created a space that found the spark of hope that was within me. He wow. did not tell me I had six weeks with. Yeah. He just gave me, you know, he just humanized the whole experience. And um, I think if all you know is the conventional doctor's offices, where you sit in a prostrophobic windowless window office waiting for doomsday, then you don't realize that the experience could be friendly and humanizing. And that is what I found at the clinic, and that was very significant in me making a decision to continue a treatment with your with your clinic. Yeah. Right? That, that's just really important. So, so then um, Dr. Miranda, Do, Dr. Schellinger transferred me to you because your specialty is oncology. That's right. Right? And, but since then, it has been many years, I have consulted with all the doctors at the clinic. I've yeah. consulted with you. With Dr. Shilinda, Dr. Anju, and I've also been treated by the Punch Karma technician. Yeah. Okay, and over the years, I've had the Punch Karma, the vitamin C, and other nutritional IVs. I've had yoga therapy, I've had nutritional guidelines, and I've had the mistletoe therapy, which I think is what probably broke the back of this cancer. Disease. That's right, yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I was invited three years ago in Germany to speak at a mistletoe conference and we I presented your case and oh, okay. uh, and so it was very well accepted and uh, there was another interesting uh, patient uh, who was not my patient I uh, met and she has a syndrome called Lynch syndrome so this is a uh -huh. genetic disease where people have colon cancer in their families and this lady she had a been diagnosed I think at age 37 with the this Lynch syndrome and she had the surgery done and then she refused the chemotherapy and she used the nutrition and the mistletoe and she was in remission and uh, her name is uh, the Ivalis Page and she has believebig.org a website where she is actually trying to educate people about the mm -hmm. natural medicine and the benefits of mistletoe. So we're, we're very, very you know, interesting. You know, you just brought in mistletoe, so I, th I just thought about it to put it. And she was fifth year in remission after that. So really, you know, interesting that uh, uh, that mistletoe and combined with other therapies she have done. She was even with the Lynch syndrome, which is a genetic disorder. Yes, yes. And I have to say that um, in recent years, I've had CT scans, blood tests, or cancer screening, and everything was good. And I mean, not good on that. The threat of cancer will always be a reality for me. Yes. But I've made adjustments in my daily life yeah. to help me to heal and strengthen myself so that the That's, likelihood of recurrence yeah. you know, diminishes, just becomes less and less as time goes on. Yeah. So one, you know, one thing which I want to interject here, uh, Roseanne, is basically, you know, we are treating the whole body, not the cancer. Cancer is just yeah. the mistake on the part of the body. And it somehow it has kind of uh, that misbehaving child in the in the house which is uh, yeah. not does not obey the laws of uh, the family and he he's right. revolting you know so that's what the cancer is and he's saying okay uh -huh. i'm not going to listen to you i'm going to do my way and when you right. are putting that norms in it the body know what to do so we are not treating the cancer we are treating you as a whole yeah. so that yeah. is the difference i think with and now we actually you hear a lot about immunotherapy if I talked about immunotherapy 10 years ago, a lot of uh, medical community would laugh at me and say, you know, how come this immunotherapy can you know, reverse the cancer patient? Because everything to them was, okay, you have to do chemo, you have to do radiation. But now there are, even Fred Hutch has a big wing right here in Seattle on immunotherapy. And a lot of you know, leading centers in the, in the country are opening up immunotherapy centers. And so interesting, you know, that the how even the cancer treatments are evolving in the mainstream medicine too. Yes, yes. Um, you know, let me segue from that to say that um, that your treatment then, you know, following on from what you say, is not only for serious illnesses like cancer. 
right? Yeah. On, on the contrary, what it does is that it brings balance to the body so that serious diseases are less likely to happen. Exactly. You know, if yeah. you heal your body in the early stages and you live, you know, you, you live a balanced life in certain ways, then it's less likely to happen. It, it cleanses so that the healing can naturally take place. That's right. It strengthens so that the immune system can do its job efficiently because we are all equipped with immune systems to deal with these. But when things are out of balance, then it doesn't work. That's very true. You know, it's a, yeah. what you brought in is a, we had, that's why I started this program, Your Body is a Natural Pharmacy. Because, you know, we don't have to get a pill from outside. The pill is inside us. But what stops that pill of the healing is our own created, self-created imbalances. We engage yeah. ourselves yeah. not doing exercise, not eating the right food, or not eating the real food. You know, it's really yeah. interesting. I've been teaching this for almost 36 years now. And a lot of time, you know, even my patient who have got better, and they will bring some bag of health food, uh, you know, um, um, bag in there, which has some chips and, and said, oh, Dr. Sodi, it's natural. I said, but this is not the mother nature didn't make it. <laughs> it, yes, didn't, yes. it did not grow on the tree. It didn't grow on the shrub. Right. So it does, that is not natural. So, you know, a lot of time people don't realize that natural food is the real food. What the God right. has given to us, that's the real food. And funny thing is, our DNA are going to do some mistakes every day on a daily basis. Uh, there is actually some statistics that every second there are some mistakes in the DNA. But what corrects those mistakes by the DNA is our natural food, eating a lot of green vegetables, nuts and seeds. Like, for example, uh, Brazil nuts has selenium in it. And selenium yeah. is a powerful in correcting the imbalances. Uh, the other nuts and seeds have zinc, but there's so many phytonutrients, uh, the plant nutrients in it, which corrects it at every level. So again, you know, coming to the, that your body is a natural pharmacy. And what you're saying is so true. When you bring those elements into it, the body heals automatically. And it may be cancer or it may be a heart disease. It may be a diabetes. So right. one thing, you know, uh, while we were, uh, you know, you, you had a lot of difficult times. I remember uh, your uh, husband who also got diagnosed with the pancreatic cancer. I saw him once and then he died very quickly. I think within one month he died because he opted to yeah, do the chemotherapy. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So can you touch bases on that one? That must be, you know, you were going through your own phase of metastatic yeah. cancer. And then on top of that, your husband got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Yes, um, so let me talk a little bit about this because this was in 2012 and you're right, I was going through, I had been dealing with cancer for a few years and, you know, things were looking pretty grim and um, my husband was my, as you know, he was my caregiver. He was there with yes. me all the time. Exactly. He would come down to Bellevue with me and sit in the car and wait for me. Wonderful man, home, yes. And take care of me. He was just a wonderful person. Yeah. And then suddenly he was diagnosed, and he was actually diagnosed. I mean, when we when we got the final um, the confirmation that what was happening to him actually it was esophageal cancer that has spread to some of his organs. I was wow. actually in your clinic doing an IV, right? Yeah. And if you, re I don't know if you remember, I I called on the phone. I had my cell phone, and I called somebody. I think it was either you or Dr. Shailen there. Anyway. And one of you came out and you ran out to the parking lot and you found him and you brought him in and yeah. you started talking to him and talking to me. And But, you know, it was too late for him. Yeah, I know. And um, it, it was difficult. I have often said that, you know, it was um, it was as if he was walking me to death's door. And then suddenly it was like, just a minute, whose turn is it to go through here? Wow. You know, and we found that it was, it was his turn. Mm -hmm. And... That, that was very, very difficult for me. Um, you know, so, you know, death just came knocking on my door and took yeah. him away. And I, w I will share with you something that I told him that I could think I could share with people now without breaking down. What I told sure. him was, I said, when you cross the bridge, you will find that you are exactly where you need to be. Mm. And it will be exactly the right time. It will be exactly the right moment. Yeah. And as I said that, I internalized it myself. Yeah. Right? And it's just, you know, that really close confrontation, dealing with a, a life-threatening disease, 
or whether my husband dying from a similar disease really made me confront death and you know and and just head on just yep. head on yeah and um yeah and i what i got from it is that so if you don't mind if i talk a little bit about this sure. i i came i came to understand that to claim death is to claim life that i yep. had to stop putting around it and avoiding it and being in denial about it and being scared of it i had to claim it and I had to see life and death as two sides of the same, same coin. Same coin, exactly, exactly. Yes. Yeah, I actually, have to we, not I think, be afraid of it, yes. Yeah, we had a lot of discussions about death, you know, and uh, uh, if you remember, you know, my favorite term is that we all are recyclables, you know, we, we nobody's going right. to live in this earth forever. I've not seen anyone living forever. But again, I think what matters is the quality of life. Death is nobody can tell you when somebody's going to die. And that's why yeah. I don't like doctors, you know, when they start uh, selling you that this many months you have, you know. But uh, yeah. that is such a reality. Everybody's going to have to die one day. And the one yeah. of the biggest fear I see in a lot of chronic diseases is the fear of death. So I think you did a lot of work. Can you, can you, can you share, you know, what happened, what you went through when you have to face the death, real death in front of you? And then what, what happened to you? Yeah, you know, it's hard to like put it into words because I feel that we don't really have, we don't really have the words, like we haven't developed the vocabulary. Yeah. So, you know, this is like stumbling, not very polished words, but um, when he was dying, one of the things that I did was that I kind of put my hands on his chest and um, tried to breathe together with him. Yeah. So that we had the same rhythm, mm. you know, we had the same rhythm. I got into the same rhythm with him. And then I just let him go, you wow. know. Mm. And what, just putting my hands on him like that, somebody who was so close to me, yeah. I felt the natural rhythm. Yeah. You know, I felt the natural rhythm of death. I felt the natural rhythm of life. Mm -hmm. And I saw that that is how it has to be. Yeah. That we have to see death as natural in order to experience life as natural. Yeah. Right? And fear is what paralyzes us. Exactly. Fear is what prevents us from taking autonomy. And what had happened was that, you know, previously, as a, you know, someone who had migrated and become a, done a PhD, you know, yeah. um, become a professor, I had been a child with an individual will. And it seemed as if cancer and the conventional cancer, treatment of cancer, was, could take that away from me. Yeah. You know, suddenly I was expected to be compliant. I yep. was expected to be submissive. I was expected to not ask questions. Yeah. And I felt that when I came to the clinic, it gave me back my autonomy yeah. in my struggle against cancer. And it is in that process that one has to extend that sense of autonomy to death as well. Exactly. You know, and I was able to, I think also what was very important to me was yoga. Yes. And, you know, Dr. Shillin is the one that I think got me started on yoga. And I decided to, I did some yoga therapy. And Wonderful. Just finding that stillness within yoga and being able to see myself as integral to nature. Okay, yeah. And I think, you know, that happens all the time. Yes. To, to claim nature, you claim the, the moon. Last night there was a beautiful moon. The luminescence of the moon, the majesty of Mount Rainier, the ebb and flow of the Pacific tide, the temperate forest in which we live. I started to um, appreciate. I started to understand all of yes. that and experience it. Exactly. And see that that complexity and that richness is who I am, who we are. Yes. And that to live and to die is to plumb that richness. Exactly. You know, what, what yeah. you brought is such an amazing thing. Even uh, when people breathe, the cancer cell dies. You know, the cancer cell cannot live in oxygenated uh, atmosphere. When we do yoga, when we do breathing exercises, we are cutting down the cancer cells. You know, every one of us, I'm making cancer cells, and my yes. fellow here in the studio, Dustin, is making cancer cells, and everybody, all of us are making cancer cells. But that doesn't have to kill us because our body is very well-tuned, and it has a amazing approaches, and it makes precise tools to kill that. And, you know, you brought in the Mother Nature. There has been studies done in Japan 
when people walk out in the mother nature their immune system got boosted for just one yeah. walk a week 40% i don't know any medicine out there which can boost up your immune system yeah. 40% you know if this is the drug there'll be multi trillion dollar drug you know we all love to have that kind of a pill which can but the pill is again the mother nature and you and so which yeah. is very beautiful what you what you brought in and so wonderful yeah keep keep going please you you we're yeah, you, very know, encouraging I, yes yeah when when you walk through the forest i was walking through the forest the other day with a with with someone and there was a tree that had fallen down on the side you know yeah. and a person said to me um well, what happens to the life of the tree when it dies like this yeah you know and i said to him i said look at this tree do you see that tree do you not see life Yeah. You know, do you not see that you know that the decomposition that you are exactly. seeing is life giving? <laughs> yes. Do you not see how many mosses and vines are growing Bacteria, on it? Bacteria, viruses, you, there's so many yeah, things. Do you not see all of exactly. it? Exactly. The ants that are feeding on it. Are you seeing life or are you seeing that? Are you sure you're not seeing life? Yes. What a you wonderful thing. Yes. That? Yes. Yeah. So I I think that is, you know, what you're saying about, you know, your immune system gets the gets a lift when you walk to the forest but when you walk to the forest you also see nature you also see the richness you see life and death yes and you know that you are part of it and you know your consciousness is part of that consciousness yeah right? and it's a transformation you know you you're transferring from one to another but it never dies you just go on changing its forms of it and in actually yes. hindu philosophy <laughs> we call it uh, rebirth you know and we got to go on recycling ourselves into different things And so it, right. it never dies. It's just like a continuum. The process is it, continuum. Yes, it's a continuum. You have to see them as continuum. Exactly. Yeah. You have to see them as along the same continuum. Um, and, you know, you asked me to um, to talk about how I made that transition and the transformation. Yeah. Of course, there are a lot of things. But there's one image that also stands out in my mind that I would like to bring to you. Sure. And, you know, I'm sure you are familiar with these images. And I think maybe a lot of your listeners are. which is the image of lord krishna mm-hmm. reaching to the rafters to bring down the jars of dahi you mm-hmm. know that image you know that sorry yeah 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 yes you know that sorry right yeah yeah he re- he is a child he sometimes he is presented as climbing on the shoulders of other people other kids yeah and he brings it down yeah and he cracks it and he feeds it to everyone yeah he feeds it to the neighbors his friends to his pet monkeys he feeds it to everyone yeah and you know what it is unlimited yeah yep on, the only time you realize that it is bottomless is if you try to empty it that's right right that's when you realize it is that the nurturance is unlimited and i think i will plumbs that infinite those infinite measures of healing those well springs of healing that are never ending that is an image that stuck to me yeah and i said it is there for us all the time it is never ending this is the logic of a myth that we can utilize that is here for us as another way of understanding what happens to our bodies yeah right yeah. so there are different logics and western science gives us certain logic about how to understand the the, the structure of the human body yeah. and the care of the human body but then there is also a logic that comes from certain myths there's mythic logic yeah and i think one has to explore those different logics and put it together with what you already have learned from western logic yeah you know and then make sense of it you know That's and right. i'm not saying that one should reject one or the other no i think we're very they're, they're all the same <laughs> basically yeah, we, it's funny it's all the same yeah we we are very fortunate here that we have available to us different sciences that were developed in different contexts and it's up to us to educate ourselves and know which how we want to draw what yeah. we want to draw on right and um <clears throat> and you know that's how I gradually transform my thinking not my re- rejecting anything but by including more and more into my consciousness into how I think through anything that I have to deal with yeah you know one thing is uh, uh Uh, uh i think i also ask you to read a book uh, by anita murjani dying to be me 
I think you must have yeah. read that book. And yes, in that, I did, yes. yeah, in that book, uh, Anita, she was also uh, was diagnosed with metastatic cancer, and she was in the hospital, almost dying. And uh, then you know she saw her father, and when she was in that twilight zone of death, uh, she saw her father coming to her, and who was very calm and he was very tranquil. And she and he asked her, "Why are you so fearful?" The death is not the end of it; is the continuum. Yes. And somehow, when she understands that, that the fear she had for the death, and she actually goes into remission with metastatic cancer. So, yes, the, I yes. think the emotions are not properly. A lot of people I see because they have a, a sudden death in the family, and all of a sudden next year they get diagnosed with the cancer, uh, yes. or there's something happened very drastic. And you, know, you also shared one time with me. Uh, when you're growing up in Trinidad, and uh, you know you, uh, you know your your I think grandparents were Hindus, and you were kind of uh, got into the different religion mode, and that was kind of a little forceful on you, and you you did not somehow did not like it. So it was interesting uh, thought process, and I I would like to you know uh, have your word. What what was that? You know what what was that about? Because you you tell me that there was a identity issue that you were not. Uh, uh able to survive with with that but uh, i don't know i'm trying to think about what it is <laughs> i was so you know you know because i think when you said in trinidad you were when you were growing up there was a confused about who you are yes 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 i yeah because okay so some people probably don't know what you know what it means to be a trinidadian and um you know, and the, the whole history of being uh, my 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 ancestors who were brought from India yeah. under a system of indentureship, you know, to Trinidad and, uh, you know, under colonization. And Hinduism was taken away from us in the sense that um, in order to be educated, we had to convert to Christianity because all the, all the schools were Christian schools. Yeah. Right? So that is what happened to us, and that is what we were fed and, yeah. um, and then as I grew up, I, I just started to question, like, um, is this where I should be? And is this something that I'm missing? And is this something that has been compelled upon me? And, you know, so just asking a lot of questions that I, 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 just, I just can't belong to this anymore. And I had to explore for myself. Yeah. You know? And as I told you, um, one, of the, um, one, one of the things that I had to do was to to go back to India. Yeah. And I did that I this, know, recently. Ago, just quite recently. <laughs> yes. I just had to touch bases. Yes. You know, I And you nev- never never been to India before, isn't it? No, I had never been to India before, but yeah. it was something I had to do on behalf of uh my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents. I know that I had to do this because my grandmother had been telling us that we need to do this. So Keeping those memories alive for us. Yeah, yeah. So and I think I you, what, I have to do it. Yeah, what what I'm trying, what I'm alluding to it, that the identity crisis, you know, because you yes. you're not understanding who you are, uh, are yes. is doing a wrong prom- programming. I'm not, you know, saying that you know you should not be Christian or not a Hindu or or Muslim or anybody, but the confused identity is creating a wrong programming on you, and that yes. is creating a fear and anger in you and the yeah. anger fear frustration attachment these all are part of disease yes yes and, you yes know, uh yeah i understand where well, what you're talking about and um i think um in my case then there was a migration to the united states yeah okay and um so then there is a new another culture to deal with and um, what made it more stressful was that I was now away from my family. Yeah. So I was away from my family. I was away from uh, my my familiar landscape and um, you know just a place of real discomfort, real alienation. That's so right. So just comp- compounding all the other identity issues that I had had in my mind, and now with fewer and fewer emotional resources around me to help me cope with it. Yeah. Just very much increase the stress, you know. Yeah. Of, you know, uh, unfortunately, yeah. and the 
across the board any immigrants around the world when they go to different cultures uh, they have more heart disease more cancers more diabetes uh, because i think they get uprooted from their culture roots and yeah. the language is different the food is different the understandings are different i remember when i came to this country and i will speak a british english and when i say a word a and that was taken as a word b because there was uh-huh. a missing you know kind of a, i think small yeah. things in it it was oh i didn't say that you know it's like a whoa so it's really interesting so you know you you get confused so what are you saying and what other people are understanding so i think i can understand i think that every immigrant goes through that kind of uh, phase and now actually you know, living in in uh, washington state almost for 30 years uh, i understand it because now i learned the culture i have gone through the schooling here and uh, plus seeing so many patients and i I'm, i'm learning so it's really you know interesting what you what you're saying and which is so true so uh, rosen one one question for you so what uh-huh. changes you have done in your life to okay. stay on top of your health because you know one thing is certainly the quality of life is very important and uh, i when i see you um, periodically and uh, we try to you know you you still have your oncologist on board because this is what i tell my patient don't fire oncologist because i'm not a, i'm not going to tell you fire because i want that person to be on board because he is the one very well trained to follow yeah. you through and we will help you with the whole process So yeah so what can you tell me what is your routine looks like these days what do you do Yeah so I do still see my oncologist and I do I do still have my CT scans when is needed and my um my my blood test when needed and you know every now and then I drop you a text saying doctor sorry I had my test and everything yeah. good yeah. so yes. I do have my oncologist but what I have done is um well the the changes in my diet Yes. So um now I try to eat uh, you know um uh, more hearty portions of uh, vegetables and greens um organic whenever possible. Yes. Um I do something some things I have cut out of my diet altogether like any kind of refined sugars. Yes. Um practically no alcohol. Um This is I a touchy subject. Alcohol is a touchy stronger. subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've never been a smoker so that is not an issue. That's good. Yeah, I, it, the alcohol reminds me I have another patient who uh, she was also on our radio show here. Uh she had a breast cancer and uh, she when we followed the treatment so I told her you know she loved her glass of wine although she was not yeah. indulging in it and uh, so Uh, and to say you know wine is not going to be good because what happen your body makes more toxic load than it can handle and especially yeah. when you have a cancer your body is not you know not going into homeostasis not in balance and so you're going to trigger the bad cells so she uh, i think a couple months into it she brought a painting done by her granddaughter and so the grandpa is drinking the wine and the grandma is not drinking the wine and there's a wine glass <laughs> and there's a then cross over it and she said dr sodi you will get the kick out of it look at this drawing drawn by granddaughter grandpa is enjoying the wine but she put a cross on my wine glass so that was very yeah. interesting <laughs> yes so, so yeah so also um I think exercise and yoga for me uh, have now become integral to my life. Yes. And um I cannot overstate the value of yoga because I think that is essential. I think if you're doing yoga every day, I do it every day on my own and then once or twice a week I take a class. Wonderful. It just it just kind of balances you so that you reach for the right thing. Wonderful. You know, and you you kind of pace yourself. Yoga tells you watching you know, when you need to take a rest it tells you when you need to go for a walk yes. without even thinking about it you're just so centered and so focused that you know what you need it helps you to sleep better and you know yeah and i i still come to you when i have a problem um and uh, i am more wary of um what i'm told by my conventional western doctors uh for example when i was um when i was planning to um to travel about two months ago and my doctor told me I need to get certain vaccinations and I came to you and you said this is the protocol you need to follow and you gave me certain herbal supplements that I needed to take and I took them and I was well. Yes. I did not get <laughs> sick. I did not need any vaccination. Yes, yes. So it, it has just taught me to be cautious of what I hear and to 
ask further questions yes and explore further what i could be doing yeah no one one thing is uh, which uh, the science is actually exploring it and giving us very wonderful answers i don't think the bacteria is the our enemies is us when the body is out of balance that the same bacteria can attack us and create a problem so i'm actually i'm not i will not say that i will be so afraid of the bugs and bacteria out there uh, because body has amazing remembrance for them it has a, that dna which can recognize it and uh, but if you help that process of uh, homeostasis uh, and you know just for that sake a uh, lot of patients who has gone to southeast asia china india even latin america i think maybe more than 3000 of them who has not done any vaccinations and they have none of them has come back with any bugs or giardia or malaria and uh, all those kind of stuff you know we have been able to ward off just using natural remedies so you can see the powerful powerful you know remedies uh, we have in natural medicine yes yes um what about the the zika virus uh, are you recommending it people to uh, any kind of herbal Um, you know we wrote an article on it i think you should go on it? yeah you should go yeah, on our website we wrote an article that was you know yeah, yeah neem yeah. neem will work very well but again i think this has been also kind of put out of the proportion i don't know why is that done this is very common we we wanted to make a fads you know we come up with the one fad and then we make it like a big hype in the in the market and we uh, scare people the heck out of them is like a swine flu that half the population is going to wiped out i wrote an article at that time too and it didn't happen and it's funny like uh, uh, we have over like hospital next to our you know uh, clinic and there will be people were lined up and then they were refused that they will not take because uh, it did not turn out to be good and the people were so afraid they were coming to my clinic and and, and crying and begging to take me take them as a patient cuz they've been told that they have swine flu and they'll be dead and uh, and they come to me and this is okay calm down i don't think you're going to die just give 3 to 7 days and you should be all fine and that's exactly what happened in 3 to 7 days they would be all fine rosen i think yeah. you know you, you had a remarkable story to share the rest of the world you should write a book you have already written couple of books three books you have written how many books you have written I have published four books. Four yeah. books, yeah. So you know, mm-hmm. you, 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 you. I think you deserve to write another book because this is a phenomenal, Thanks, wonderful yeah. story. Yeah. And uh, you know, you also brought your friend Adrian to us, and who has done a remarkable job too. And uh, he put on the Facebook that how many pounds he lost, sixty pounds of weight or something like that. He lost fifty pounds already. I brought him all the way from Trinidad. Yes. To put him into your hands because yeah. <laughs> I knew that you know you would give him an intelligent. Yeah, tell him that when he. <laughs> tell him that we're going to have a dinner together when he reaches that goal we talked about you know so okay, yeah i will do that thank you very much for coming on the show and you know what an inspiring story and i think maybe people can learn and and, and more from you uh, and uh, taking care of their health because i don't believe that any medicine is wrong by the way but also we have a responsibility to, to take what is the best for us and everybody's okay. individual thank you very much i'm going to you know uh, uh finish up with a little bit of the tidbits for how they can do to prevent the colon cancer thank you uh, okay, uh rosen okay i just want to say i just want to say one word sure which is if there's anybody listening that wants to get in touch with me and chat with me i'm very willing to do that thank you thank you very much okay, really appreciate that you. you could put them in touch with me okay wonderful. thank you thank you take thank care you. so guys you know uh, what a wonderful story so i'm going to you know a lot of natural food you know we can do to take care of our uh, uh, even colon cancer berries just simple blueberry blackberry raspberries strawberries take care of your cancer turmeric the curry powder the indian curry powder is amazing powerful there has been studies done people who has a metastatic cancer has failed chemo radiation 33% people out of them who were failed chemotherapy went into remission what a wonderful story in my clinic we see a lot of these people who has done in not very well and got you know when they come to learning that what they need to do for their body because every one is different we cannot put them into the same parameters and if we follow the laws of mother nature eat healthy sleep healthy walk in the mother nature and do wonderful laughing with your family friends have good time you will be all healthy you not only you will prevent cancer but heart disease diabetes and all the chronic disease which is killing up thank you very much